The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. What you see in Malaysia is the behaviour of large numbers. The dominant groups that shape and implement the law because they are in political power tend to criminalise the grievances of the minority more often than they would police those from their own community, especially if they are political elites. If we look at social media right now, Malaysians are expressing their displeasure against the government, against the rulers and so forth. So to see that Malaysians are not expressive, no, they're very, very expressive. It's just a matter of deciding, okay, is this hate speech? Is this extremism? Is this racism? That's something which we've not agreed upon yet. In this episode, Policing Political Discourse in Malaysia. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Every society has its politically delicate topics, ones that when discussed openly, risk stirring emotions in the body politic. In Malaysia, a multi-ethnic, largely Islamic federal constitutional monarchy, those topics are the three R's, race, religion and royalty. They're considered so volatile that discussing them as regulated by the state in its bid to maintain not only racial unity, but also the primacy of Malay and Muslim communities among the nation's 38 million people. Malaysia's federal constitution enshrines freedom of speech, yet broadcast and print media have long operated under limits on what they can discuss openly. With the rise and now dominance of the online world, laws have been modified or extended, leading to the removal of online content, the blocking of websites and the criminal prosecution of people and organisations deemed to be crossing the line in their discussion of the three R's. At the same time, in a shifting political landscape in Malaysia, ultra-nationalist voices are increasingly taking to publishing hate speech and engaging in online harassment with seeming impunity. So what's actually behind the taboo on publicly discussing the three R's in Malaysia? Exactly what is taboo and how are laws being used to restrict discourse both online and off? Who benefits? And what effect is it having on the health of Malaysian democracy and society? Joining us to look at the hows and whys of political discourse in Malaysia are Dr James Gomez, Regional Director of Asia Centre, a research institute based in both Malaysia and Thailand. And we're also joined by Dina Zaman, a Malaysia-based writer and social commentator, as well as co-founder of Aman Research, a Kuala Lumpur-based think tank. Uh, welcome back to Ear to Asia, James, and welcome, Dina. Hello. Hi. Can we start by looking at what's behind the three R's, James? What's the special position of Malays, Islam and the monarchy in Malaysia, and how do the three intersect? Yeah, to understand the three R's in contemporary times, one really has to look back at uh, colonial history. Uh, the argument is colonial experience in Malaysia displaced the traditional position of the Malays, Islam and the royalty, uh, given the large diaspora that the British brought in uh, as labour. As the uh, colonial power waned over the years and it was time for the British to exit, there was a cry from the Malay nationalists that the framework of the British withdrawal would actually give unfettered access and equality to everyone who were resident in Malaysia at that time. As a result, the whole discourse around the three R's has been to bring back the special position that the Malays, Islam and royalty enjoyed. Uh, this is a political argument and was a rallying cry that brought UMNO into power uh, for over six decades uh, through the coalition Barisan National. 
And of course, UMNO is now back in power in a coalition after losing power in 2018. And we'll get to that. But but Dina, can you give us a, a sense of if we're talking about Malay and Islam and supremacy within the broader Malay community, how diverse is that community? Okay, I would like to say, and I hope I don't sound like an apologist for all Malays in Malaysia, and nor do I speak on behalf of the Malays, but we are actually very diverse, not necessarily ideologically, but also the way we live, the way we think. Um, In the past few months, you know, Iman Research, I personally have been studying the Malays and the movements, yeah? And we realized one thing, when you look at someone who's traditionally Muslim, The mindset can be different. It can be that, you know, the person's extremely conservative or some of them can be very, very flexible. Uh, In the case of religion, some would say, look, I still believe in a syncretic faith. You know, how we combine Islam and certain Hindu healing traditions. You have that. You also have a group of people who are totally populist in mind and heart who believe that, you know, the pro-Malay agenda is more important than the pro-Islamic agenda. It's a bit of a circus, yeah, Ali, when you look at the Malays and Muslims. Something which is coming up more and more is that there is a divide. There's an intra-faith divide among the Muslims versus the Islamists. So if you go on Facebook, you'll see a lot of them shouting at each other, you know, accusing each other as, oh, you're a Salafi Wahhabi. You're a Jahil, Jahiliya, basically, you know, and you're uneducated. You're not a proper Muslim. You're just Malay. So you're looking at Two groups who are fighting for voice and space in Malaysia and demanding their rights. What they both share is this. These two groups feel that they're at siege. One, Islamophobia. Two, Malayphobia are on the rise. And it's something which even I myself am trying to figure out why. When you are the majority race and that, you know, the elite Islamists, elite Malays also have some benefits that are not accorded the average Malay or average Malaysian. James, let me ask you that the circus that Dina just described there, the interfaith divide, if we go back to the three R's, does that mean the three R's actually cover a really broad gamut? Well, I think the three R's are best understood as political tools and they are used by different political groups and they articulate different trajectories to kind of very briefly and simply uh, map it out, there are essentially three types of articulation of the three R's at the political level. As I mentioned earlier, UMNO led the first articulation, a very traditional uh, and conservative articulation of the three R's, which call for the special position of the Malays, Islam, and the royalty. And the Malay category was also inclusive of the indigenous people from Sabah, Sarawak, and Peninsula Malaysia. Um, But as the political developments moved very quickly in the last few decades in Malaysia, and uh, Anwar Ibrahim, who himself was from UMNO, uh, was pushed out, he picked up on the articulation of equality and justice that was being put forward by largely minority communities in the broad sense of the word. So he articulated what, you know, the Asia Center report terms as a progressive set of three R's. It doesn't call into question the three R's as such or dismisses it, but rather builds it as a core, a sense of, you know, uh, racial, cultural equality and the notion of justice. Now, the third Three R's are the ones that are articulated by those who are in contestation with the other two articulation of the three R's, the traditional and the progressive uh, three R's. And we call this the more sort of ultra-nationalist or right-wing articulation uh, of the three R's. So it is this three R's political ideology that are jostling together to try to get the largest vote share from their primary constituents, which is the Malay Muslim community. But they all of them, you know, to some extent, even the traditional ones and the right wing ones do weave in some element of multiculturalism. Otherwise, the point is mute. So, James, can you explain, though, how regulation of discourse 
using the three R's can be used so differently by the various groupings. You talked about three types of articulation and they are indeed in in conflict, well, certainly in contest with each other. So how can the rules around what is acceptable and what is not be used by such different groups with different aims? I think we largely had one group that was in power for six decades, that is the Amno-led Barisan, and they articulated and expanded most of the rules we see in Malaysia today that are used to control, um, you know, discourse both online and offline. Uh, I think the logic uh, initially was quite accurate. Uh, The British left and society was in a mix. There was a lot of political difficulty. And then the position of the three R's got good political support. So the way to approach it, and this is pre-internet era, was to look at what was already on the books. And this was the Penal Code and the Sedition Act. So the aim was to ensure that the communities lived in harmony, that any transgression, insult of a particular community or religion uh, could be managed in order to ensure uh, society didn't get into some kind of a, a violent mix. That was the intention. But later on, and, and I say this very briefly, the, the laws to apply for political reasons to kind of shut out those who articulated counter discourses to this and primarily the progressive one. Now, the laws got an update uh, when you know society moved online. And Malaysian society had a slow start in getting online and then very quickly rose in great numbers. So Malaysia was kind of caught. Its online, you know, legal infrastructure was just coming up, was largely relying on the Multimedia Act uh, to police their online content. But I think we are also in a position where there is other types of discourses that could be dangerous and can inflict society and cause, you know, a disruption. And I think there's a set of laws that are also missing that needs to be articulated. So, Dina, what's your thought on that? And, and indeed, how control is or is not exerted over discourse in an online world? Okay. We don't have a single law addressing hate speech. We do have several laws which address different aspects of uh, hate speech. But the main thing is that what we researchers, you know, legislators are all discussing, uh, what constitutes hate speech? For example, uh, a person from a minority community expresses his or her anger towards Islam, towards the Malays, right? For a person like all of us who are in this podcast right now, we'd probably be able to take it because we realize this is the reality of living in Malaysia, how we've treated minority communities and so forth. But to someone else, that would constitute hate speech. That's racism. The thing in Malaysia is that, you know, I just feel that with all these laws, they are adjusted to a ruler's or a political party's or the government's need of the law. Now, having said that, we know that during COVID, there was a spike in hate speech. You know, all of us were locked up in house. Everyone was, you know, frustrated. But there was a spike in hate towards migrant workers, refugees in Malaysia, as well as non-Malays or non-Muslims. Now, of course, the easy answer would say, oh, you know, everyone's frustrated, they're staying at home. But to us and all of us who work in this, you know, in this space, we realize that anger has been penta, has been repressed all these years. We saw a spike with people no longer using, you know, pseudonyms, but their real names saying, you know, we don't like the king and we hate the king. And you see this on Instagram. This was even way before TikTok became very popular in Malaysia. We saw a lot of that, even the Malays bashing out the royalties on Facebook. People are saying, we don't want royalty. We don't want the monarchy anymore. They don't function. What are they doing? They're taking away all our money. So that's when people are more vocal. So while we researchers encourage this, you know, this freedom of speech, getting the anger out, We also have to see when is it hate speech and when is it expressing one's frustration. And we haven't found any single law addressing this. It seems to be like, you know, a cut and paste job. Uh, We know recently that uh, I think maybe a few months ago when someone insulted the king, he was arrested. And that's a no-no. But he is one of the very few who've been arrested because if you look at social media right now, 
people are expressing their displeasure against the government, against the rulers, and so forth. So to see that Malaysians are not expressive, no, they're very, very expressive. It's just a matter of deciding, okay, is this hate speech? Is this extremism? Is this racism? That's something which we've not agreed upon yet. And in light of what's happening in Malaysia now, where Islam being Malay, they become even more sensitive in Malaysia, I think a lot of people are actually thinking, how do we talk about this? How do we air our grouses without going to jail? Some don't care, but a lot do, because nobody wants to be you know, slapped with a fine and be headed off to a lockup. But Dina, from what you're saying, it's actually quite easy to do that. I, I take your point about what is and what is not hate speech, and, and that is a challenge for so many countries, and we can get to that in a minute. But you seem to be suggesting that, in fact, the rules around the three R's are uh, pretty loosely enforced. Yes, I agree to that, you know. Um I mean, as we talk now, I'm just looking at, uh, you know, at a website, looking at all these laws when it comes to freedom of speech. And James and I, we lived through all this, you know, when you had the police coming in, arresting journalists, et cetera, et cetera, you know, for writing or publishing certain things. We had Ops Lala in the 80s that was under, I think, Dr. Mahathir's reign as prime minister. But when you look at it, right, sometimes you wonder, well, why isn't this person uh, being arrested or at least you know, taken in for questioning for inciting hatred. Why? Because this person belongs to a certain faith, belongs to a certain majority race. Is that why he or she is allowed to get away with it? And then you see people who are from minority communities who are arrested or taken into questioning or they just disappear. So it's really, to me, I feel that if we're going to have this loss, it should be implemented towards all. It shouldn't be a cut and paste and a situational thing. But people can, of course, disagree with me. I don't know. <laughs> James, do you agree with that assessment that, you know, there's free reign to say what you like as long as you don't upset a particular group and the laws are being used for political purposes more than anything else? Yeah, I mean, Dina has framed it uh, accurately and correctly. I'll just add nuance to it. One is the law of large numbers. What you see in Malaysia is the behavior of the large numbers. So it's similar in Myanmar, it's similar in Indonesia. So the dominant groups that shape the law and uh, implement the law because they are in political power tend to criminalize the grievances of the minority uh, more often uh, than they would police those from their own community, especially if they are political elites. There's always that political dimension. The second element was the issue of royalty. Now, it is public knowledge the royalty is, is seen to have overstepped on its business dealings, some of which have environmental implications. Uh, this is a matter of public record. There is some unhappiness, even from the communities that are traditionally supportive of the royalty as an institution, as a cultural institution. However, because the royalty has also, in the last years, especially with the change in government, taken a kind of a mediating role, almost a quasi-political role to balance the competing political forces, as well as occasionally stepping out and calling out extremist behavior, or also articulating at the national level a multicultural tone, because of that, uh, the royalties have been given a discount for overstepping on the business and environmental front. And what I'm trying to explain is really that why is the royalty allowed to carry on in spite of you know overstepping sort of business and environmental boundaries, simply because the positive contribution of the royal institution is also seen uh, as a political mediator in this difficult political transition times, as well as stepping up time and time again to take a more multicultural tone, especially in moments when the right wing or extremist discourse comes heavily into the public domain. But at the same time, James, do you agree with what Dina was saying, that people do criticise royalty and are not punished? Well, I guess that's more a policing consideration. Uh, prosecution is often um, you know, directed at influencers and 
those uh, who are politically um, influential, so to speak, as opposed to uh, lay comments and so on and so forth. Dina, James talked about a political dimension to this. If we look at the, the hate speech, how connected is it to the political climate? And, and if we go back to the defeat of the Nationalist Party of AMNO in 2018, do you think that that's when this sort of came to the fore? Would you characterise it like that? I would say we've always had hate speech, yeah? When you had you know newspapers like Malaysia Kidney and Softwath coming up and social media, right? There were certain political parties or certain political actors who hired cyber trolls. I think we all remember seeing these people inciting hate everywhere, right? Uh, In comments and all that. And that would happen in the early, maybe mid-2000s, 2005, 2006. So there wasn't a great number. But I think the fact that certain actors saw, okay, there is potential here to use cyber trolls to actually incite hate and also to frighten people. And because they're paid very well, uh, you're able to hire a lot of people to actually spread these lies. So I think when I was in Malaysia, Kini, which was in like 2003, 2004, we had the beginnings of hate speech then. And it was all disguised under all these rather interesting names. Now, what happened was that over the years, until 2018, you would see this on Facebook and Twitter especially, People saying, we hate this, we don't like this, get out of the country, et cetera, et cetera. And Twitter is really, really toxic. I don't know how it's like now, but before, when it just arrived in Malaysia, it allowed Malaysians to express themselves, you know, using their real names or different names. And you no longer needed cyber trolls because the Malaysians were saying, okay, Twitter is free, it's unregulated at that time. Uh, We're going to come in and express how we feel. Then you go up to 2018. At that time, there was a spike. I remember this. There was a group called Manara. And my God, (laughs) uh, the things they spewed on Facebook and Twitter. And they would go after people they felt were not aligned to the then government. And they disappeared, basically, when Najib and his administration lost in 2018. Having said that, it didn't mean that hate speech went away. It didn't mean that trolls didn't exist anymore. In 2018, so, you know, Pakatan Harapan won. There was an increased spike in racism. And I think it was a free-for-all for everyone where they felt we can express how we feel because I'm no, the Malay majority uh, political actors are no longer there. So I believe I remember Mujahid Rawa having, you know, his hands full dealing with allegations about him, you know, promoting LGBT issues. That's one. Two, we had the Seafield Temple riots. So during that time, you realize that, oh, it was no longer about people talking. People were taking action in real life. And then we had a lot of changes after that 2018 to now. There was still hate speech. It was horrible. But I feel that it's different, you know, when you compare to what happened before. It's more insidious. I also feel that The hate is there, but it's in disguise in a different kind of language. And that language, because it sounds so politically correct to all of us, if you are not familiar with these actors' way of thinking, their mindsets, and I'm talking about far-right groups, yeah? You probably just think, okay, it's just an expression of speech. I'll forget about it. It's not really important. Now, from 2018, what we realized was that as, you know, the Malays, the majority or the Malays, grappled with the idea of, you know, a new government which had a lot of non-Malays in cabinet. And this is not unusual. We had that in the 70s, yeah? But for them, it was a shock. And that's why we had an anti isid rally. And for them, it was something which they couldn't comprehend. And that was when the Malays themselves, the average Malay, who wouldn't, probably is not involved in politics, started expressing their opinions on Facebook and social media, saying, we have to get back our power. If our government can fail us, then it's us, it's Malay power, which can save all of us. So you see a different kind of dynamics now. James, this this is reflected, isn't it, in research that Asia Centre has done where you, you go back to 2018 and there's a quote in a recent report of yours that it created a vacuum where Malays need to defend Malays. Yeah, 
Again, I want to frame it as a general political phenomena that is affecting the world, particularly in the region. And this will really help us understand the Malaysian case. What we're actually seeing is the weakening of the dominant political force. And in this case, is the AMNO AMNO led uh, Barisan National Coalition. Now, over the uh, last few elections, its actual number of seats in parliament has dropped drastically from over 100 to uh, 26 in this last election. So, this has created a kind of a political vacuum in the articulation of three R's, at least in terms of its political strength. So as a result, uh, you have the growth of ultra-nationalist group. Now, this phenomenon is quite similar in other countries and uh, many examples also uh, in Southeast Asia of this phenomena. So these groups who are the traditional supporters of this political power base, you know, in this case, uh, AMNO, they take it upon themselves to articulate things that are not politically correct uh, in support of the uh, favorite political party or power base. They were also able to do this quite easily this time because with the rise of online media, so these groups also have access now uh, to a new kind of communication device that allows them to literally throw their voice further and in larger numbers. So as a result, hate speech has grown wide and deep in Malaysia. So this becomes good fodder for political parties who then are shifting to the right, to ride on this wave. And this is what we have seen happen. We have Bersatu that started quite weakly after some leadership change for Imahatea. And then it picked up a good number of seats in this election. Pass, whose seats has been sort of an ebb and flow, also picked up its higher number of seats in any single election. So this makes for a very, very strong right-wing block. And it is not something that is going to go away because of the socialization that many of the Malay uh, Muslim community have experienced. It was quite insular, kind of a bubble format, and they are largely in the rural areas. So if you look at the electoral map, you can see the, especially the peninsula divided uh, where the North is largely conservative and right-wing in that sense, in that it rode on that political discourse. And then you have kind of a more sort of progressive alliteration of the three R's that was returned uh, strongly in other states. So, Dina, given that sort of characterization of it, I mean, you talked earlier about having a, a divided polity. If the right-wing is is more than tolerated, it's actually used, is that not potentially dangerous to those in the middle ground and indeed even dangerous to the coalition in power at the moment? Oh, it is very, very dangerous. But let me just backtrack a bit, yeah? And maybe it's because of Iman's work. Now, a few years ago, in 2016 to be exact, we went on a nationwide study to ask why young Malay Muslim youths were very attracted to jihadi expressions of hate or love, you know? And we went around and even then they were expressing how disenchanted they were with the government of the day or any other governments, yeah? Simply because they felt that one, you know, the government never addressed their needs and demands as a Malay youth. Hence, that was why they went off to the internet and started looking up all these groups and decided, okay, um, I identify with this group and their messages because they speak to me. So that was a discussion that I believe that even our police, you know, our enforcement agencies were looking at in the years of 2014 to 2016, the language of jihadis and militancy in Malaysia. But then when we had a 2018 change in government, right, the whole thing shifted to, yes, exactly what James said, you know, to far-right nationalism, pro-Malay rights, we don't have space. If, you know, we were talking about jihadi uh, sentiments, now you realize that since we have more Chinese and Indians in government, we really have no space here. And we had discussions. We're saying, look, you're the majority race in Malaysia. What makes you feel that you don't have a place in this country? I mean, again, they cited that they are at siege. Um, 
They felt that, you know, nobody was listening to them. And the only way they could take care of themselves is by banding together. Now, for this government, I do actually think that this government has a lot on their plate and that they shouldn't be naive about the problems that we have right now. I mentioned earlier about certain populist organizations who've mainstream hate in their language. And they're very, very active, very pally with certain government, civil servants, certain political actors who probably, well, may not have that uh, intelligence nor common sense to realize that this is the enemy that you should be aware of. So I believe this government, they're not only having to deal with the debt that we owe other people, it's also populism. And I think, and this is just me being very simple-minded, when you address these issues of populism in Malaysia, how do you address these issues when you are Malay and Muslim? Wouldn't you feel guilt? I don't know. How would they approach it from the political point of view or from the legal point of view? How are you going to deal with the mess that Malaysia has become? Multiculturalism in Malaysia, and this is, again, my personal opinion, not Iman's, right? I feel that with multiculturalism in Malaysia, it fits depending on the class and income that you come from. So you're able to close your eyes to certain things. But for the average Malaysian who's just trying to struggle, who's, you know, who's just trying to make sense of his life, trying to get scholarships, loans for the children to study abroad because there's no future here, right? they're going to be very resentful, and they already are. I have a lot of people WhatsApping me across the races saying, I don't know about this new government. I voted for this government because I wanted change. But we're seeing with what's happening now. Can this new government actually deal with Perikatan National? But populism has always been in Malaysia, but not to this extent. And to understand why this has happened, we also have to look at Islamist politics that started in the 70s, 80s. How did we split into this? How did we come like this? I just hope that this government is able, as they try to you know, sort a lot of things out in Malaysia, right? they will have to look at the mess that we have created. Partly the policies, economic policies, social policies, were they created with a rakyat in mind or were they created by elites in power? These are things that we have to face. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at Melbourne Asia Review. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by writer and social commentator Dina Zaman and Asia Centre Regional Director Dr James Gomez and we're talking about policing political discourse in Malaysia, who it's targeting and to what effect. Uh, James, looking in the context of the government of today, a new Prime Minister, Anwar Ibrahim, he formed a government only after an alliance with UMNO. Uh, why is it, do you think, that hate speech is not being shut down? Well, it comes with a political cost because the kind of hate speech we are seeing is really kind of right-wing discourse and they move a lot of ground. The political calculation is if you move against these groups, you tend to lose uh, your political support, both while in power and you know, looking at the current political calendar, down the track, uh, because we will have to keep in mind the state elections for six states are just months away. So there's that whole calibration that is going on and is being taken into account. I mean, the other thing is the feel for these groups that espouse hate speech, because uh, one of the things that is not publicly articulated is really the funding. Quite a bit of the funding comes actually from uh, private foundations or even businesses set up by sitting or former politicians who have amassed a great deal of wealth. So there's a certain lack of transparency of of this whole sector, you know, uh, the types of uh, foundation in Malaysia, we call it Yayasan, 
how many of these, who funds it, what are their work. It's very private. They do have some staff, some of the bigger ones, but ultimately the person who's funding or giving the money to these uh, foundations eventually calls the shots. And is that about essentially funding a group that organisation or that funder would see as being capable of fanning the flames of something that might put them in a better light and do damage to their opposition? It will not be that straightforward or clinical because, you know, such funders will always want some space in between. So the programs, of course, would be articulated differently, support for the Malay community or religious education, research, so on and so forth. Uh, They would not give specifically because that would be political suicide if it's found out. So there's always intermediaries. So these are one cluster of groups that fuel hate speech. The other groups, again, you know, not much transparency there, are so-called public relations firm or consultants. They also produce the discourse, so they get the big level narrative or objective. And then these are the people who articulate the strategy uh, and then, you know, commission people to write up the content. And the dissemination is a bit different because it's usually not so much paid. It's those who are ideologically aligned. So these are two features of the Malaysian landscape. Uh, Most people know it's there but there's not enough spotlight. And Asia Centre has just slowly begin to look at this sector more deeply because it was one of the things that we discovered uh, in doing this uh, report this time. Dina, can I ask you to give us a sense of where most Malaysians get their news and their public affairs content from and, and how different this discussion would be if we were talking about conventional media and not online? Uh, Malaysians, like many, many people around the world tend to consume a lot of content from the internet, YouTube, you name it, and now TikTok, yeah? When you look at, say, my parents' generation, whatever you see on you know, instant messaging apps like WhatsApp, Telegram, that is God's truth. So this is how a lot of people consume news. They look at the headlines, clickbaits, and that's the truth already. Interestingly enough, I've begun writing for a mainstream media now And the editor told me this, that they're getting a spike of a Malay readership. And she said, we've never really had that because we've always appealed to a different clientele. But this is uh, interesting because this new Malay readership have money, but they're traditionalists and conservatives. It doesn't mean that they are hateful. I've got to be very mindful about that, yeah? But the fact is, they're now looking at English mainstream media to see what people are doing and talking about race and religion. They want to understand us, so to speak. So right now I'm saying, okay, we've always had people going to Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, or basically sharing the news on WhatsApp and all. But the fact is there is a little group now that's going back to mainstream media like the Star, NST, Sina Harian, to look for that news. Because a lot of people feel that in Malaysia, you can't exactly trust web-based media. Unless you are totally left-wing, so you read news media like Malaysia Kini and so forth. But for those who distrust Malaysia Kini, Malaysian Insight, Malay Mail Online, they'll go back to mainstream media. And that, as I said, it's interesting to see that it's a different group of people who are buying English-speaking newspapers now. And if I can go back to almost the first point that Dina made, James, and ask you, if we're talking hate speech... And this is something that many countries grapple with. But what exactly is it? And where are, just like we talked about the three R's and and what is permissible and and what is not, where does hate speech sit? And how easy is it to to say, yes, that is unacceptable? Well, currently there's no international law that either defines or calls out hate speech because it's conflated with freedom of expression. So you have a right to criticize. That's where the legal position is. And at the national level, these are managed through penal codes and sedition acts, and then a new phenomena called harmony laws that have appeared in places like Singapore and Myanmar, and to some extent also considered in Malaysia, but they did move forward on that. So these are kind of the three cluster of laws uh, at the national level. 
but the international legal system or community makes a difference between hate speech and dangerous speech. So dangerous speech is seen as the type of speech that calls for violence against other community to take up arms and things like that. That's the kind of legal definition, both at the national and the international level. So at the extremes, would the government in Malaysia take action? Yeah, it still will be a political consideration. And also it will have to pass the test usually of the law of large numbers. Against whom does it take action? Is it the minority group or the majority group? And also certain particular institutions, you know, uh, we discuss also the royalty or people in power. But in order to understand when and why they would take action, um, you have to kind of break down hate speech. And very quickly, there are really four categories. Hate speech against migrant workers, refugees, and foreigners, essentially. So that's one. You have hate speech against sexual minorities and women. That's another one. And then you have the traditional hate speech targeted at the other religion, the other ethnicity, which is what we see a lot being played out in Malaysia. And then another phenomenon is political hate speech. They're all kind of interrelated, but it's not so clear in Malaysia. For example, if you go to Thailand, the red shirt and yellow shirt dichotomy, uh, that's a clear phenomenon of political hate speech, and there's a lot of that in Thailand. So coming back to Malaysia, I think when you speak about governments uh, using the legal mechanism, uh, we really need to sort of par down these four subcategories of hate speech and then investigate which one they are more keen to pursue. And James, given the prevalence of hate speech, what does that mean for broader discussion, broader discourse in Malaysia? Do you find that it's being crowded out by the loud voices? Well, I think what I see in in the broad sense is really the impact on the economy. Here, I would like to bring in the fourth R, the ringgit, that's the currency for Malaysia. I think in all this discourse, the economy has been forgotten. I mean, the Malaysian ringgit has been taking a badgering for the last many years, a lot of it tied very closely with the political stability and the country. Uh, investors still feel anxious when they want to move money into the country and to invest because they do want a political, the stable environment, environment that's friendly for investment, and also an environment that's genuinely multicultural so that they feel at peace when they bring investments and hire workers or bring in other contributors from abroad. So I think that the whole fourth R, the impact on the ringgit, is also missing in the discussion. And and I think this has to be brought to the forefront in telling Malaysian society, the Malaysian leadership, why it's in their interest to ensure there's a more sort of palatable political as well as cultural environment for everyone. Dina, bearing in mind what James just said about the economic impact, but do you see an impact on broader discourse that people may be more reluctant to put their head up, to have a voice for fear of being targeted by the right? Does it crowd out a more reasonable voice? It's a mixture, yeah, Ali. I know of an academic, I won't name him, he wrote for a Singapore University journal where he talked about right-wing movements. And the university uh, was almost smacked uh, with a lawsuit by that particular group. He had to change everything. In the end, he just took the article away. So there is that sense of fear, like, God, you know, these people are very powerful. Um, They're Cambridge educated. They can speak. They know how to argue. So there is that fear and people say, okay, how do we counter this narrative then? At the same time, at least for me, I'm glad to see more Malaysians speaking up and risking it. I see writers who are saying, you know, I don't agree with what's happening. Why the Malays? What about me as a minority Chinese or Indian who comes from a working class background? I see this conversation on social media and I think, good, someone's talking about the elephant in the room. And having said that also, because of what's happened during our the latest general elections, I got onto TikTok to see 
what the drama was all about. Yes, there was a lot of hate videos, right? Talking about, you know, Islamic rights, Muslim rights. We had to get the pandatangs outsiders out of the country. It was horrible. But at the same time, I also saw many young Malaysians, Malay Chinese Indians, countering that narrative and saying, no, we don't want this. We want multicultural Malaysia. This is what I keep telling everyone. You know, as James talked about just now, about donors, funding, and so forth. Perhaps we shouldn't be funding all these big, fancy programs and hotels. Invest in our young, in local universities, in vocational colleges. Go out to the field. I'll say this. A lot of our work, when it comes to research and you know activism, is so urban-centric. You need to go out there, right out to the rural areas and have a chat with them. Talk to them. I know it sounds very idealistic, very, very simplistic, but that is how you get the message across. We are not talking to each other. We're living in our bubbles. We are, you know, being angry within our bubbles, but we're not doing the right thing. People think that, okay, you know, how do I become a better friend to someone who is not of my race or religion? I mean, it's not about just getting that token Malay, Chinese, Indian, and then you have a friend. <laughs> Friendship is to be earned and it's also built on trust. So we need to actually go back to the roots of friendship. How do you become a good friend to whoever? And look at common values, family, poverty, helping each other out, living in a community. There's another thing also that I believe which can actually help with multiculturalism in Malaysia. And I hope big business hears this. When you talk about urban development or even rural development, why must it be that a certain family or person of a certain income is able to live in a multicultural place? Or if it's in a working class neighborhood, big developers see this and say, oh, we're going to take this and then it's going to be, you know, a different kind of enclave. We can't have that anymore. I feel that for Malaysia at least, I think it's not just civil society, actors, you know, people in the space who are doing the work. Business also has a responsibility to help create a multicultural Malaysia. It's not just about profits. James, would you agree with that? And do you also see a role for politicians, for parliamentarians, for other institutions in society? Yeah, I think all the stakeholders that Dina has outlined and some more uh, need to contribute to the multicultural experience in Malaysia because a lot of the communities operate in silos. They go to different schools, they worship differently, and they also, you know, geographically stay different communities, you know. So I think there needs to be a lot more cross fertilization, a lot more interaction, dialogue, and politicians can do that. In parliament, for example, parliament, that, that's kind of a safe space, impunity there, but really to push it on the positive front and also debate when there are difficult laws being promoted. So, so I think the parliamentarians have a role. Business also have a role in terms of how they hire, take a more multicultural approach, especially if the business allows for it. And then, you know, civil societies and NGOs, that can monitor the situation and call out transgressions. I think technology companies also have to play a part, especially looking at hate speech, mitigating some of that negative content online. I think we, we also need to look at the ultranationalist group, get a better understanding of who they are, who funds them, how they operate, because uh, that's still not clear. And finally, I think we need to build an environment where people feel safe. Presently, people don't feel safe. When you talk about the three R's, they tend to lower their voices or they will dismiss it. You know, we don't want to be part of it because it's sensitive. So not only do we have censorship, but we also have a whole range of self-censorship. And this is why, you know, the needle really hasn't moved much on this conversation. We are almost out of time, but I do just want to finish with a, a quick question to both of you. And uh, Dina, I'll, I'll ask you first, are you optimistic about uh, a greater opening of discourse in Malaysia? This depends on the day and how I woke up, Ali, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I mean, okay, 
I look at it in a very dark and gloomy manner because this is the work that we do. You're constantly dealing with this. And yet when you go out, you know, you meet your friends, right? And I'm really happy that my friends are all from all the races, you know, and we talk about anything and everything. And then when I go out of Kuala Lumpur to places like even my hometown in Trungganu, granted Trungganu is mostly Malay Muslim, but you actually see people integrating with each other, the few minority Muslims there who decided not to move to Kuala Lumpur. They just want to stay in a small state. So I have days when I think, you know, actually multicultural Malaysia is something we should aim for. And I believe the young, especially the young, will do this. But there are days also when you look in the newspapers, you think, mm, I don't think anything good is going to happen. So as I said, it really depends on my mood for the day. <laughs> and what about you, James? I believe uh, more conversation around this is inevitable simply because you cannot stay isolated no, no matter how much of a online bubble you kind of live in these days. Uh, people travel, all Malaysians travel and travel very widely. Uh, so there's that contact point multiculturally, uh, worldview and things like that. They study abroad. So there's that dimension. Uh, they are flagged by Singapore in the south, Thailand in the north. So there's that constant infusion. Um, it needs the foreign dollar to build this economy. You know, there's a property overhang in Malaysia. They are looking at the foreign dollar. They want to generate income from foreigners, rolling out retirement visas to nomad visas, intercultural, international marriages. So it's inevitable that the conversation will continue and widen, but that it will no way reduce, take away, and lower the impact of the core conservative element and right-wing element, although I think they will tend to wane in the mid to long term. Mm. Yeah, but not disappear altogether. No, but the more the more conversation everyone can have, the better. An enormous thank you to both of you for joining Ear to Asia. I'm very grateful for your time and for your insights. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Our guests have been Dr James Gomez, Regional Director of Asia Centre, a research institute based in both Malaysia and Thailand, and Dina Zaman, a Malaysia-based writer and social commentator, as well as co-founder of Aman Research. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 25th of January, 2023. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons Copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.